Hey, it's Mike here today, and as per your requests, I'm gonna talk about a recent study that came out last week that was accompanied by many headlines, some of which were benign, like this one from Science Magazine. What would happen if all Americans went vegan? But that butter in your coffee site, Bulletproof, originally titled their article, new study pinpoints the pitfalls of a vegan diet. But the anti-vegan cake goes to quartz with if the entire US went vegan, it'd be a public health disaster. And then this one, which is a bit more enticing. If the US went vegan, emissions would drop, but there's a catch, a new study says. What catch? Well, a quick read of any of these articles shows that it's partly about how there would be an allegedly measly savings in greenhouse gas emissions if the whole U.S. went vegan, and the other half is about how everybody in the U.S. would become deficient. From IFing Love Science, just like current vegans. So the general trend of these articles is that veganism could help a little bit, but would be horrible. Here's the bait, and there's the switch. Here is the study that all of these articles are talking about, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, or PNAS. Oh, you thought I was gonna say, get your mind out of the gutter, it's study time. The study did look at a hypothetically all vegan US without animal agriculture at all, and they did say it would, quote, create a food supply incapable of supporting the US population's nutritional requirements, incapable. They also call it non-viable in their conclusion, like, are we all gonna die? Are all vegans dead already? To believe the statement, you have to believe that vegans can't meet their nutritional requirements, which is ridiculous, and furthermore, to extrapolate this to having a negative health outcome, as many have, is also equally ridiculous. Especially when you look at studies like the Adventist studies, where vegans had 15% lower mortality rates than their omnivore neighbors. And we will cover particular nutrient statements in a bit, but first let's cover the environmental aspect because their claims are equally off base in that area. Not only did they start with what I will argue is a very low percentage for total animal agriculture greenhouse gas emissions, but then they went ahead and made up ridiculous scenarios to keep the vegan savings even lower. For all agriculture combined, they chose 9% of total emissions, a figure from this EPA report, and then about half of that as animal agriculture, so 4.5% total for animal agriculture. But the reports they drew from notoriously under-report greenhouse gas emissions from animal agriculture. Just look at respiration, which some have pinpointed to 21% of all global greenhouse gas emissions, as this World Watch report mentions. They also use longer global warming potential time frames, which lessen the effect of methane that is emitted by cattle and other ruminants. They use a 100 year time frame, which puts methane at 25 times the power of CO2, but a 20 year time frame, which one would argue is more appropriate because ice caps are melting right now, puts it at 72 times CO2. And then there's land use, how these reports ignore how much carbon, the massive amount of land that is used for animal agriculture, would otherwise be sequestering if it was left in a natural state. And from this USDA report, the US uses about half of its lower 48 land for animal agriculture between grazing and crops, and that includes deserts. From that World Watch report, quote, by itself, leaving a significant amount of tropical land used for grazing livestock and growing feed to regenerate as forests could potentially mitigate as much as half or even more of all anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. I know the US isn't all tropical, but the same principle applies. And now back to the study at hand for the kicker, a vegan diet didn't even save that 4.5% from livestock. As Science Magazine put it, quote, for better or for worse, it's not that simple. Eliminating animals altogether would leave behind tons of corn stalks, potato waste, and other plant byproducts that right now end up in livestock stomachs. And if that uneaten waste got burned to eliminate it, the waste would churn out 2 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. Yup directly from the study, quote, it was assumed to be incinerated. Oh, this assumption is astounding. It's like the straw man of all straw man, like taking a straw man, lighting it on fire, and then saying it released too much CO2 so a vegan diet is crappy. Let me just make that more clear. That's a nice vegan diet you've got there. Oh, oh my, look at all that CO2. And really, the only options aren't just feed your extra plant matter to animals or burn it. There are so many other options. There's composting. And in fact, this can go in a completely different direction. We are talking about plant residues that are left over after harvest, such as corn stover. And from this write-up by the Agricultural Research Marketing Center, turning corn stover into ethanol could provide up to 10% of our gasoline needs. 
That would knock into the transportation slice from the EPA's pie chart. And from this National Renewable Energy Laboratory's chart, corn stover ethanol is four times less fossil fuel intensive than standard corn ethanol, which is made from food, and seven times less than gasoline. So it's pretty funny that they took this major solution and actually turned it into a problem that made a vegan diet save less greenhouse gases. But part of that gap, that lack of total savings for a vegan diet was because they said we needed to create synthetic fertilizer to replace all of the animal manure that is currently being used in farming. And that of course would emit greenhouse gases. In addition to the crazy idea of repurposing human waste, we can also look to veganic farming. There are many large scale veganic farms that easily meet their nutrition requirements by rotating crops. Well put by Go Veganic, quote, many people believe that animals are a source of nutrients like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Yes, animal products contain nutrients, though these elements all come from the plants that the animals ate first. Instead of using blood, bone, and manure, we can simply use plants directly to grow other plants. To be fair, at the end of the studies, they list limitations, and one is the assumption that that fertilizer previously sourced from manure will need to be synthesized. It's funny though how the manure situation only became a hit against the vegan scenario. Well, our current situation is that we have 35 billion humans worth of solid waste created by the livestock in the US, and that is frying the Gulf of Mexico. Anyway, their conclusion is that after you burn all of this extra biomass and you create all this synthetic fertilizer, a vegan US would only save a measly 2.6% of all greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> That's enough for any old American meat eater to say, oh, that's hardly any difference. I'm just gonna keep eating the way I eat. So the short selling of the vegan scenario was pretty ridiculous. So let's quickly just create a equally ridiculous scenario in the other direction using the EPA's basic breakdown of emissions and see where we get. Everybody goes vegan, the US reaches a BMI average of normal, just like observed vegan populations in the US, and that creates a subsequent 20% reduction in transportation emissions due to lighter people and people actually being able to bike places and have energy to exercise. And from this study on obesity and climate change, the numbers do appear to line up. Cross-referencing their figures with the EPA's figures, it looks like obesity accounts for about 5% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. Don't forget that 10% offset of gasoline by using Stover ethanol. And so add those together, that's maybe about 8% of total greenhouse gas emissions. Why not? They made up numbers. And with respect to another finding of the study that the vegan scenario had nearly a quarter excess of food, well, we can take that and turn it into biofuel. From that World Watch report, quote, if biomass feedstocks are chosen and processed carefully, then biofuels can yield 80% less greenhouse gas emissions per unit of energy than coal. So that could make a massive dent in industrial and residential energy use emissions, but let's be conservative and just say minus 5% of total. Yes, these are assumptions, but so was burning everything, Nero. Could then use all that extra farmland saved from no longer grazing and growing feed for animals to grow plants like hemp that can create bioplastics and super eco building materials and reduce petroleum product use. I mean, look, here is a board made out of sorghum. Get real. So that's maybe another 5% off industry. We can then use some more of that land that we saved to grow algae biofuels, which would reduce transportation emissions in the form of jet fuel and diesel. So another 5% off from transport, and that would also create a massive amount of algae-based DHA, which I'll get to in a second. Finally, you can subtract that full 4.5% of total greenhouse gas emissions from a livestock and just simply not burn things and do some crop rotation. And the total is about, drum roll please, 27.5% of greenhouse gas emissions saved by going vegan as a country. Obviously, I'm just using all of that as an example to show how their vegan scenario was dripping with a little bit of anti-vegan sentiment. So why were they? biased, seemingly. Well, the study itself declared no conflicts of interest. Looking at the two authors, it appears that their living may depend on animal agriculture. There's Robin White of Virginia Tech's Department of Animal and Poultry Science, and then Marybeth Hall of the USDA's Dairy Forage Research Center. These are people that work in animal agriculture and looking at the lay of the study, at least to me, it read a little bit biased. Like for example, whenever they had a positive seeming statement about the vegan scenario, it would immediately be followed up by a negative one. 
Like although the vegan scenario produced almost a quarter more food, it sucked in terms of nutrition. Yet they will string like eight positives to animal agriculture together in a row, as you can see in the abstract. Okay, finally, let's move on to the nutrition stuff here. Remember, they said that the vegan scenario was incapable of meeting people's nutritional requirements. And that from the current diet, quote, more than 50% of the food derived calcium, vitamins A, B12, and D, choline, and riboflavin were from animal products. Uh, but guess what? For the vegans that are alive right now, currently none of those come from animal products. I mean, riboflavin, that's a B2, and just something like almonds is a B2 powerhouse that has more B2 per weight than beef, for example. Obviously, this is how people get those nutrients, not how people have to get them. And one thing that you will not hear in any of the articles, suspiciously, quote, When animals were removed, gross supplies of many nutrients increased markedly and were in excess of domestic requirements. So a vegan diet actually provided a surplus of certain nutrients. But, of course, they followed up with, however, without animal-derived foods, domestic supplies of calcium arachidonic, EPA, DHA, and vitamins A and B12 were insufficient to meet the requirements of the U.S. population. Now, I had to laugh about the arachidonic acid part because not only do we make enough arachidonic acid in our own bodies, but the high arachidonic acid intake from animal product consumption in the U.S. is heavily linked to inflammation, such as inflammation-induced depression and suicide risk. EPA and DHA are another two that our body does make itself, but plant-based doctors do recommend supplementing this a couple times a week to keep your levels up and be safe. But guess what? It's already being put into cow's milk anyway, and nobody bats an eye. And insufficient vitamin A. Funny how from this study, at least, the vegans had no statistically significantly different level of vitamin A deficiency. Maybe it was the carrots? Those are way too complicated to grow. Then they say, quote, for the deficient fatty acids and B12, animal products are the only non-supplemental sources commonly found in human diets. But they should mention that they do supplement some animal feed with B12, so kind of secondhand, sort of not true. And as for a vegan US, they could simply add B12 to the water supply, put it at levels that natural untreated water has, which is more than enough to meet your needs in a day. Thankfully, vegans are improving in this area anyway. Back to that study I referenced for vitamin A, B12 was another nutrient that was not statistically significantly different in terms of deficiency between vegans and omnivores. Probably due to fortified plant milks and stuff and getting supplementation down, who knows? But this next statement really calls into question everything here for me, and that is that looking at the current diet, we already have a plethora of deficient intakes for various vitamins and fatty acids. That makes the conclusions about the deficient intakes in the vegan scenario a little bit less compelling, don't you think? It's just so beamingly obvious that the US vegan scenario would be just outright healthier. You know, we've got an average BMI that we've recorded in vegan populations. 15% lower mortality, 15% lower cancer rates, 78% lower diabetes, etc. So no, this study does not pinpoint the pitfalls of a vegan diet. And in the end, I find it very interesting that the study neglected to mention all of the negative non-greenhouse gas emission related environmental impacts of animal agriculture. The obscene amount of land you for grazing, the water use, the dead zone creation, and of course all the negative health impacts from eating animal products, which include, you know, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and of course those antimicrobial resistant infections from superbugs from livestock. They mentioned none of that, but vegan deficiencies. Okay, there was so much to cover here. I wish I could have covered even more of this study, but let me know down below if there was something in particular I missed or if there was any ways that a vegan scenario would save greenhouse gas emissions that I also missed. Also, let me know, do you think these researchers were genuinely biased or were they just being typical reductionist scientists? All right, thanks so much for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe so you'll see the next one and thank you for watching.